physical security threats, controls, and recovery measures. Does everybody see that? Do you, do you see that? And if we look at chapter 16 and review the rest of the material, there's a part of physical security recovery measures that squares or tracks with system backups or data backups, right? Now, have you ever had a chance to actually work a backup of your system or perform a backup on a server or anything like that? Is that something that you've had a chance to do? You can respond by chat if you'd like. No, okay, you haven't. So there, there is an industry standard that is time honored about how best to perform device and system backups. And this is one thing we want to incorporate into our material for um, this module. The unfortunate uh, issue is that in the fourth chapter, I mean, in the fourth edition of our textbook, when you go to inspect the textbook, what you find is that there's limited detail in chapter 16 about this, and it's really embedded in chapter 12. And one thing that I just discovered is that there's a fifth edition of the textbook that's rolling out right now, which is why we had uh, some difficulty uh, with access just now. So one thing I wanted to do was to um, suss out or ferret out the material that we need to consider about performing regular backups and how those are, are done. And then what I'd like to do is include just that section from chapter 12 as a, a reference in our study guide. Um, You'll notice also, also that the National Institutes of Standard and Technology has a special pub publication, SP 800-123. And it includes the process of security maintenance. And, and this has to do with physical, uh, physical security as well. And in order to be able to recover from security compromises, you have to have those regular backups, right? Now, system logging and monitoring is a part of physical security because if, if uh, it turns out that there are compromises that are in play for a system, that oftentimes uh, some errors will start to appear or surface in the logs, the system logs. So auditing and configuring auditing is also a control that can be used uh, to keep tabs on security aspects of the physical environment, right? If if um, if the temperature sensor in a server starts to trigger and it logs an error saying that the system temperature is too high and so on, or if there's uh, too much access to a given folder, you know, there's there's a lot of failed requests for an access in a given folder. This would be the first indication that uh, everybody needs to brace for impact and make sure you have, what, a decent backup. So this is really a time-honored approach to system and device security. And I would argue it's, it's not strongly emphasized in recent uh, cybersecurity updates as much as it should be. I think the assumption may be that it's covered in IT uh, courses and in information technology courses or system admin um, training. And uh, what we'd like to do is take a little bit of time to make sure we understand the basics about backups. Uh, one aspect about logging that's really important in Windows, if you're going to engage logging, and this is one thing that we'll cover uh, in our next chapter as well. Uh, it's a two-step process. You have to enable auditing and then you have to turn on the specific file system objects that you want 
to be logged, you have to enable those and set and change settings there. So just remember that logging isn't as simple as turning on logging. You have to enable system logging at the device or system level, and then you have to identify what things you want to audit specifically, events or changes. Uh, when someone takes control, they modify permissions, uh, there are passwords that are reset. Those are the types of, of e events that are typically uh, configured for system logs to capture. Are there any questions about logging before we continue with backups? So in terms of data backups and archives, there is a lot of confusion about uh, data that's archived as opposed to data that's backed up. So a backup is essentially making extra copies of the live current data at specific regular intervals. And that allows uh, for the recovery of lost or corrupted data over a relatively short period of time of a few hours to some weeks. So essentially, the data of interest is here and now. When we archive data, what we're doing is saying that this is essential record from previous seasons and it's occasionally referenced. So we want to migrate that data or uh, transition that data to uh, a certain type of additional storage so that it doesn't clutter up the system so that it doesn't bog down disk space. And, and basically, uh, this could be for tax purposes. You have to keep uh, financial records for a period of five years if you're involved in uh, federal funding or seven years, depending on the grant. Sometimes it's seven years from the time the grant ends. So if a grant is a five-year grant and then you run the entire length of the grant, you have to retain the records for seven additional years for all the years of the grant, which include the first year of year five. So it's actually like a 12 year stretch. It gets to be a bit tricky, but the important thing to understand is that different, different types of data require uh, different standards for uh, retiring them and uh, moving them to an accessible archive, which again is a different storage animal altogether versus a backup where it's constantly being, re it's constantly being uh, referenced and you have to be able to recover a, a corrupted data or a failed system. Do you have any questions about the difference between backups and archives? Okay. Um, Let's take a look at what it says in chapter 16 for physical infrastructure, and then we'll um, add the slides from chapter 12 here about, about backups. 